Hi and welcome to the channel Love Obstetrics and Gynecology. In this video, I'll explain you colposcopic examination step by step. So first, I'll tell you about explaining the procedure to the patient and obtaining the informed consent, followed by asking her the relevant medical history, then the instruments and finally the procedure. As a doctor, it is our duty to explain the patient the full procedure that is uh, going to be performed uh, because we need the optimal relaxation and cooperation of the patient for this procedure. Otherwise, the view will not be optimal. Uh, you can use the pamphlets and show her the abnormal cytology and actually explain her why it is so important to undergo the colposcopy. So after explaining the procedure to the patient, we go for the written informed consent. Now in that consent, you basically explain the patient that we'll proceed with the examination. But during the examination, if we find some uh, lesion, we might need a site specific biopsy. And then also explain her the complications, though they can be less serious ones to more serious ones. All the complications related to the biopsy such as bleeding and friction needs to be explained to the patient. And in case you are going for the treatment uh, in the same setting, we go for either cryotherapy or LEAP. Then also explain the same benefits and some disadvantages related to the procedure and also the complications related to it. Also the relevant medical history is very important. For example, we want to know the patient's LMP, last menstrual period. Uh, that will determine the patient is in post-menstrual phase and that is the phase in which we conduct the colposcopy. Her parity is important as the cervical changes occur uh, during the pregnancy. After the pregnancy, there may be some traumatic lesions on the cervix. Nulli paris and the paris cervix, they vary in appearance. History of oral contraceptives or the hormonal supplements intake. It is very important as it influences the cervical cytology and also the colposcopic appearance of the cervix. Then the sexually transmitted infections, uh, they can cause uh, cervicitis, you can have acute cervicitis, chronic cervicitis, there can be presence of cervical vaginal discharges as per her infections. Definitely you require some instruments for the procedure and as you can see on the screen, these will be all the instruments that you require plus some solutions such as uh, you need normal slime, uh, freshly prepared 5% acetic acid, Nugol's iodine and monsal space. So now coming on to the procedure, see first we ask the patient to evacuate her bladder. So after the bladder emptying, then the patient is positioned on the table. It is a modified lithotomy position with the stirrups and then you place the buttocks of the patient slightly over the edge so that uh, it facilitates an easy insertion of the speculum. So after the insertion of speculum, then you have a good look at the cervix and the vaginal fornices and uh, on the cervix basically notice if there is any presence of ectropion, which basically means that the inner uh, surface or inner lining, which is the endocervical lining of columnar epithelium is now on the ectocervix. And so the you can see that there is more reddish area over the ectocervix region. There can be presence of a polyp. Polyp basically you can see also in the picture that uh, in the center you can see around the endos at around 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock position you see a fleshy reddish mass. So that is your polyp. There can be a nebothian follicle and uh, basically nebothian follicle is a mucus retention cyst. Or you can also say it as a nebothian cyst. So the columnar epithelium when it goes everts over the squamous epithelium and then the, finally those glands get trapped and covered. So the mucus keeps on painting up inside and the opening is closed. So it gives a bulging appearance on the cervix as you can see on the pictures and it is quite giving a opaque yellowish whitish appearance. On the cervix. Also, we have to note whether there is any cervical atrophy or cervical hypertrophy. Then we have some other lesions such as leukoplakia. Leukoplakia basically means that we have some sharp, demarcated, uh, lined, white area uh, which is present even before the application of acetic acid. You can also have a condyloma which is a raised area with sharp margins and uh, it can be grayish white or whitish and we can also have some ulcer 
on the cervix or there can be a presence of an overt growth over the cervix all of those conditions need to be noted for an adequate colposcopy we need to visualize completely the transformation zone and basically that means that uh, you should be able to identify the new scamoclaminar junction and the original scamoclaminar junction it is the area between those uh, two junctions so adequately you should be able to see whole of the transformation zone to have a adequate corpus there can be a uh, mucus cervicovaginal mucus or some discharge that obscures your view so in order to remove that uh, discharge or the mucus we need a uh, saline soaked gauze and we just remove the uh, discharge by it and uh, make sure that it is saline soaked and it is not a dry gauze because dry gauze is going to cause bleeding which will hamper your colposcopic findings. So regarding the pap smear or the cervical cytology, uh, see the patient is referred to the colposcopy after she gets an abnormal cytology report. Now in case we want to repeat the cytology, uh, we have to do it before the application of acetic and so it is important uh, to obtain a swab in case uh, there is presence of infection such as evident by a cervicovaginal discharge or pus and the vaginal fornuses. Uh, so we can have a swab that can test for Neisseria gonorrhoeae or Chlamydia trichomatis and also for HPV DNA testing although it should be already done before the colposcopy uh, we can go for that also along with the liquid based cytology. So till now we have positioned our patient, the speculum got inserted then we noted a few findings on the cervix along with the TZ zone and now we are going to apply normal saline. The normal supply and normal slime can be applied by uh, the sprayer or you can use the gauze. And then we change the filter to the green filter or the blue filter. And under the magnification of 15 times, uh, we see for the surface and the vessels. To view the surface and the vessels just with the application of normal saline is important before the application of acetic acid because if we apply the acetic acid it is going to cause some tissue swelling tissue edema that will lead to opacity and the vessels that are just below the cervical surface they will not be easily visible so first apply normal saline then acetic acid and then lugolzyme. Now the next thing is application of acetic acid. Acetic acid is used in a 5% concentration which is freshly prepared. So this acetic acid is applied to a 2 into 2 inch gauze which is big enough to cover whole of the cervical area. So we take this gauze and keep it in contact with the cervix for 60 seconds and then we remove the gauze and look for the look on the cervix for any aceto white area. So usually you have to note your findings of aceto white areas within a time of 2 to 3 minutes. In case you need to uh, see the cervix for a longer period of time, you need to reapply the acetic acid. The application of Ligol's iodine or uh, you know just the basic principle behind this Ligol's iodine is uptake or uh, uh, this iodine gets uptake by only the presence of glycogen in the cells. See the squamous whether the original cells or the mature metaplastic squamous cells these have glycogen so they take up this stain Ligol's iodine and will appear as mahogany brown or black some benign lesions such as immature uh, squamous epithelium or regenerating epithelium uh, they have little or less amount of glycogen as as well as the cervical intraepithelial lesions and the invasive lesions they also have very little or small amount of glycogen so they appear as mustard yellow the clamonar epithelium that is the endocervical lining it does not have any glycogen and hence it does not take up any stain and appears pink as itself then the last step in your examination is basically combining the findings of all uh, uh, three solutions that is of the normal saline, acetic acid and lipose iodine you combine the findings that you get from all these solutions now regarding the site specific biopsy see uh, you have now identified the lesion that this is my specific lesion from where I need to take a biopsy so as to rule out any invasive lesion then uh, you require is first a tenaculum so that you can stabilize your cervix the next thing you require is your 
uh, by FC forceps. It basically should have a wide jaw with sharp edges so that you can uh, take the biopsy and you take the biopsy actually from the lesion that is uh, worse looking and from the edge of that lesion so that you can get uh, normal tissue as well as the abnormal tissue and should be deep enough to extract the stroma uh, along with that biopsy and also while taking the biopsy from the lesion make sure that you are uh, you do it with quite a force that uh, it is done within one go. If you go for the multiple attempts, it will lead to the cutting of the tissue. And in case you have, you go for the rotation many as many as time you will rotate the forceps that is going to lead the crushing of the tissue. Then the sample that you have obtained, uh, immediately put that in a labeled container containing 10% formalin, and that is sent for the histopathology to rule out any uh, invasive lesion. After the biopsy, you are going to have a minor bleed from the specific site from where you have taken your sample. For that, we have Monsell's paste. It acts as a chemical cautery. It is basically ferric subsulfate. The ferric ions, they are going to denature and agglutinate the fibrinogen, which is going to cause a clot formation over that area. So we just take a swab stick, apply the monster paste to it and apply it at the site of hemorrhage and it will form a clot. The next thing is uh, as we withdraw our speculum because now we are completely seeing the uh, cervix and the vaginal furnaces. Next thing is as we are withdrawing the speculum, we are going to examine the vaginal walls and then we will finally examine the vulva, perineum, the perianal area for any lesions and if we suspect some uh, lesion over there, we can apply acetic acid and take the site specific biopsy. Now after your colposcopy is over, you allow the patient to recover and dress up and then finally explain her all her findings. Tell her what is her, what will be your management plan and how will you follow up the patient. Give her a documented evidence of all the findings that you have noted. So this was all about colposcopy, the step-by-step -step procedure. If you like my video, please do like, subscribe and share the channel. Love Obstetrics and Gynecology. Thanks for watching.